home. The train jerks a little from side to side. I open my eyes. It feels like I've been asleep for ages, but it's still dark outside. I have no idea what time it is. The carriage is quiet, except for a few gentle snores. I'm sharing it with two or three other people. I try to work out which day it is. This must be the fourth night since I left home. So tomorrow is Wednesday. I wonder what Stella and the gang think has happened to me. Maybe that I'm ill or just couldn't face going into school. None of them could ever guess the real answer. The last four days are tangled up in my head. I need to get my thoughts in order to make sure I don't forget something, that I don't leave out any important detail about what happened to Dad. I try to picture the faces of the men who attacked him. I remember their surprise when I appeared at the window, the looks of determination when they came after me. Already their features seem less distinct. Could I pick them out in a crowd? I think about sprinting down the runway, how desperate they were to stop me from getting away. They didn't expect me to be there, a witness. A flare of anger heats my chest when I think about the message they sent to Yutu's village. How dare they spread lies about Dad? It made me see how easy it is to believe things about people you've never met, especially bad things. I try to imagine I'm lying on my bed at home, looking up at the ceiling. That's where I go when I need to think. I imagine the soft padding of Hester's paws across the carpet. The little meow as she jumps up to join me, walking in circles until she has just the right spot to lie down. Then I find myself thinking about you two, sitting on the little stool in Miki's house, the smell of bread mixed with pine wood. The sky is turning a pale dawn grey. A few houses are scattered in the distance. Everything looks dull and ordinary without a magical dusting of snow. There is a crackling sound, then a muffled voice filters over the tannoy. We're due to arrive in 15 minutes. I feel a flutter in my stomach. I'm so close to home. Then with a shudder, I remember that someone might be keeping watch looking for me. I'll keep my hood up. It will be cold outside, so that won't seem strange. I don't have any bags, so maybe it won't look like I've just arrived. Another thought strikes me. I don't have any money for a taxi, and I have no idea how to get home. Almost imperceptibly, the train begins to slow. There is a rustle of bags as people start to pack things away. I slip my coat on, feeling the soft fur of my sealskin mittens in the pockets. The brakes screech gently. I've never seen this station before. It doesn't feel like coming home, but it's bringing me back to mum. I pull up my hood and step into the morning air. It feels fresh on my face, but doesn't snatch my breath away like on the tundra. I scan the ticket hall. The exit is directly opposite. People hurry past to buy tickets or make their way to the platforms. I weave round them, moving quickly without seeming to rush. A man sits on a bench, reading a book. I notice him because he is still within all the movement. It's impossible to know whether he's watching me too. I turn right outside the station. It seems the busiest route. I keep walking until I see a sign to the town centre I can find my way back from there. My legs ache from walking in the snow yesterday, but I pick up my pace. Every step is taking me closer to mum, closer to the truth. So far, I have only been able to guess at what happened to dad. At least with guessing, there are different possibilities. The centre of town is humming with cars and people, everyone rushing to work or school. I'm beginning to sweat but I don't want to take my hood down in case someone is following me. After a few wrong turns, I'm on the wide avenue close to home. I turn left onto my street. There is a black car parked in the road. Everyone has their own drive. My heart starts to beat faster. It's too late to turn back. 
The car is sleek and expensive looking. As I approach my house, I glance up, but keep walking past the car, my head down like I'm lost in thought. At the end of my street, I turn left and then left again down a dirt path which runs between the back gardens. I know that the sixth house on the left is mine. Halfway along our fence, I see a gate. I twist the latch, but the gate doesn't budge. It must be bolted on the inside. I look around to see if anyone's about, then grasp the top of the fence and haul myself over, protected from the rough wood by my thick coat. I look up at the back of the house and pause for a minute. I can't see any movement inside. I cross the grass to the back door and peer through the window. After a few minutes, I knock gently on the glass. No one comes. I knock again, more loudly. What if mum isn't here? Then I see her, walking through the kitchen. Her face is pale. She looks towards the back door, frowning. Then her eyes open wide and her jaw drops a little. She grabs the key from the hook and fumbles to open the door. I throw my arms around her and bury my face in her shoulder. I stay there until mum unwraps her arms and looks at me properly. Are you okay? She says. That's all I need to know right now. I wipe my eyes on a soft mitten and nod, then come and sit down. She takes my hand and leads me to the kitchen table. I need to hear everything. Are you hungry? I should be hungry, but I don't feel like eating right now. Mum reads my expression. Hot chocolate then. I nod again. All the things I planned to say seem to have evaporated. Hester pads into the kitchen. She sees me and gives a little meow before running over, tail in the air. Mum goes to the kitchen counter, but instead of picking up some mugs, she reaches for her phone and a scrap of paper and begins dialing a number. I leap up from my chair. Mum, stop! She looks up in surprise. What is it? Then she sees me staring at the phone in her hand. I need to let people know you're safe. They're out looking for you. Mum, I say more quietly, can I talk to you first? She hesitates. Okay, perhaps that's a good idea. She puts her phone down. When we're both sitting at the table with a steaming mug of hot chocolate, Mum says, Why didn't you call back? B, after you hung up, I had no idea where you were or if you were on your way home. Where have you been? I look at the dark circles underneath her eyes. I'm sorry, I say. I didn't know what else to do. I wanted to talk to you, and when that man took your phone, I realised you weren't alone. I didn't want anyone else listening to what I had to tell you. But they were trying to help, says Mum. I have to talk to you about Dad. Mum pauses. Yes, she says softly. We need to talk about Dad. Mum is looking at me intently. I realise that my ordered thoughts are competing to arrive at once in a swirling, confusing rush. I need to calm down. When Mum, when Dad and I landed in the Arctic, there were two men waiting for him at the airport. They attacked him. They didn't know I was there, but I saw it happen. I was looking through the window. Dad was lying on the floor. Then one of the men spotted me. He chased after me. I realise I haven't really taken a breath. I feel a bit lightheaded. Mum is still watching me closely. I ran to the plane to get away, but he carried on chasing me, even when I was driving the plane along the runway. Mum takes my hand. I'm sure if I hadn't been there, they would have, they might have. I feel a sob rising in my chest. Mum walks round the table and pulls me into a hug. It's okay, she says. You're here now. But where is Dad? Do you want to finish telling me first? I nod. I tell her about how I flew the plane alone and landed it. Mum shakes her head slowly and closes her eyes, but she doesn't look angry. I didn't crash into the hut, though, which was lucky, because there was a boy in it. A boy, Mum says. 
Yes, he had hypothermia. I gave him some dry clothes, some of Dad's, and some food. When he felt better, he drove me back to his village. Mum has stopped shaking her head, but her mouth is slightly open. So this boy had a car? No, there are no roads up there. He had a snowmobile. Mum closes her eyes and nods. Of course, she says, so quietly I can hardly hear her. I described the warning message sent to the mayor. They were pretending to be the police. They didn't want to speak to me. They didn't want anyone to know the truth. They tried to make it sound like I'd be really confused that what I said couldn't be trusted. Mum is looking at me. Her expression isn't one of shock or horror at what I've just said. She doesn't even look surprised. The energy has gone from her eyes. I want her to say something. She isn't reacting in the way I thought she would. I want to know what she's thinking. I want to know what's wrong. I want to know what's happened to Dad. Dad's missing, Mum says. A coldness creeps down my spine. What does missing mean? Mum looks so tired. B, she says slowly. There's no reason to think the people who left the message were pretending to be the police. I scan Mum's face to check that she's serious. Her expression is unchanged. Dad has done something he shouldn't have done, she says. No, I say, shaking my head. B, when you flew north with Dad, he had arranged to meet someone. Yes, they were going to take us to our hotel or wherever we were supposed to be staying that night. No, Mum says quietly. Dad had arranged to meet someone he could give a file to. A file with secrets about the oil company. Secrets which he could get paid a lot for. I keep on shaking my head. B. Dad didn't need to fly north for a work trip. They hadn't asked him to do a survey there. Mum takes a deep breath in and lets it out slowly. He was going to sell information. It's called industrial espionage. They're lying. I saw what happened. I was there. They attacked him. They took him by surprise. There were two of them. Darling, I want to believe it too. She closes her eyes. Then why don't you tell them it isn't true? Why don't you tell them what I saw? B. The person Dad was selling the secrets to had a change of heart. He knew it was risky. He got in touch with the company. He told them what Dad was doing. The company bosses said the meeting should go ahead as planned and then they could catch Dad red-handed. That's what you saw. That's what happened. The detectives explained everything to me. They've been working on the case for several weeks. My head is spinning. I don't want any of what Mum is saying to be true, and yet it no longer feels impossible. So where is Dad now? When they confronted him, he escaped. He's on the run. They say that someone else must have been helping him. We are both silent. Hester prowls around my feet, annoyed that I'm not giving her any attention. I should have done something, Mum says. Dad wasn't himself. I should have tried to find out what was wrong. I'm not used to Mum having doubts. She's always so certain. My head is a jumble of truth and lies. It feels like I'm seeing the last four days through some kind of kaleidoscope with a simple twist. The story has changed shape completely. Dad must be innocent. That was the one fact I could trust. But Mum doesn't think so, and she's told me why. The company knew all about this before it even happened. But Mum didn't see Dad running from the building, clutching his head, warning me I had to escape. She wasn't there. If she had been, she wouldn't think that Dad was caught red-handed. She would think he was attacked. What happens now? I say, trying to stay calm. I'm not sure, says Mum. I think they will formally charge him. B, there's something else you should know. Something in her voice makes me look up even though I want to lay my head on my hands and go to sleep where I am at the kitchen table. 
there have been reports in the newspapers about a local man and his daughter going missing. The company wants to keep the story as quiet as possible. They know it will be hard for us. Even so, if Dad is charged with espionage and they get wind of you flying a plane on your own across the Arctic, then that's more of a story, much more. Is that why there's a parked car outside our house? Mum looks startled. Is there? She gets up. I wonder if some journalists have got hold of our address, she says, almost to herself. Mum, if you go to look, they might think something's happened. Is that why you came through the back door? Because of the car outside the front? I thought the men who attacked Dad might be waiting for me. A wave of tiredness makes me feel like I can barely sit up anymore. Mum, I think I have to go to bed. Will you wait a bit longer before you call the police? Mum looks uncertain. Please, just until tomorrow morning. I need a little bit of time to let everything sink in. Okay, says Mum. But we call first thing in the morning. I nod. Will you have something to eat first? It's lunchtime and you've only had a cup of hot chocolate. I'll have a big breakfast when I wake up, I promise. I just really need to sleep. Mum hugs me again. I can't believe you're home, she murmurs into my hair. Hester runs ahead of me, her tail in the air. She wants to get the best spot on the bed.